open us up in a word of prayer. We'll get started. Father, we're grateful for today, grateful for the cooler weather, <clears throat> grateful for a new year and a new decade, and we're grateful for your truth, and we're grateful for the equipping uh, that you've given us to uh, withstand all of the fiery darts of the wicked one, as we're going to see uh, this morning in our class. And I just pray you'll be with us uh, during Sunday school. I do pray for the illuminating ministry of the Spirit during the main service, and I just ask that we would leave here change people, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. amen. All right. Well, there's a handout back there, and Don will help you with that if you need one. Just put your hand up. And let's open our Bibles, if we could, to the book of Ephesians. Uh, chapter 6 and verse 10. Book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 10. And as you know, we're continuing our study on the doctrine of the angels uh, towards the very end of our subsection there on demons. talked about all kinds of things related to demons and probably by this point in the study you're saying this is so overwhelming these entities uh, what hope do we have as God's people since they are our opponents and that's what gets us into defense the final little part there on demonology you know how do we defend ourselves against d demons and Satan given the fact that they're so much more powerful than we are. So we looked at things God is already doing as we speak, which I'm very grateful for. There are certain things God's already doing to protect us from the realm of the demonic. And then we began looking at our responsibility. So we worked our way through this list last time and we got to the very end here, which is really the final, probably perhaps the most important thing that we are to do in defense against spiritual uh, warfare is to put on the full armor of God. So I kind of like to call this uh, section dress for success. Uh, you know, are you dressed for success? We've seen that Paul is in prison. He's using a soldier metaphor that he can visibly see, most likely, to describe our spiritual armor. He's going to describe for us six pieces of armor. And in the ancient world, you know, as you know, battles were won or lost depending on the quality of the armor. So this subject of armor is actually a big deal. Paul is reinforcing in each of these pieces of armor a prior concept that he had mentioned earlier in the book of Ephesians. More on that in just a minute. Maybe he's discussing these pieces in the order that the soldier put them on. But this is a command. When God says put on the full armor of God, he's not giving a try this out for a while and see if it works. So this is something that God commands the Christian to do, and we're going to go through uh, each piece of armor. I'll try to describe it, describe what it represents, and then I'll try to apply it. In other words, here's how it applies to daily life. So what we have are six aspects of our weaponry, which summarize key concepts of the letter and call the church to action. So what we're doing here is really not the way to do Bible study. Um, usually when you do a Bible study, you start at the beginning of the book and move to the end of the book. Do you, got, you guys agree with my thinking on that? Because the things at the end of the book don't make sense unless you've studied what he says at the beginning of the book. But here we're not doing a verse-by-verse -verse study on Ephesians, we've done that in this church, but we're just kind of doing uh, a topical study 
on spiritual warfare, so that kind of forces us to not follow proper Bible study methodology and start at the end of a book. And since we're doing that, let me just remind you of the structure of the book of Ephesians, because this is, I think, very important to understanding the armor of God. The book of Ephesians, where we find the greatest treatment in scripture on the armor of God is divided into two parts. Ephesians 1 through 3 is part 1. Ephesians 4 through 6 is part 2. And those sections couldn't be more different. Um, The first section is all about our relationship to God. The second section is all about our responsibility once we understand who we are in Christ. The first section is about doctrine. The second section is about deed. The first section is about orthodoxy, which means correct belief. The second section is about orthopraxy, which means correct practice. The first section is about knowledge. The second section is about wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. The first section is about belief. The second section is about behavior. The first section is about our position in Christ. The second section is about our practice. The first section is about our privileges. The second section is about our responsibility. And it's interesting that when you study this in Greek, um, there are no what we call imperatives in terms of verbs in chapters one through three. It's just absolutely fascinating for me to to learn that because Paul in chapters one through three doesn't tell Christians to do anything other than to learn who they are in Christ. Now, once you get into the second section, chapters four through six, there's probably about 38 imperatives. An imperative is a command. So you'll notice the pedagogical style of Paul, the pedagogical philosophy of Paul, the educational philosophy of Paul, he never tells Christians to do anything until he first grounds them and roots them into who they already are by virtue of their relationship to Christ. And then once he thoroughly explains that, which he does in chapters 1 through 3, he explains our individual wealth that Jesus has given us. He explains our together wealth, our corporate wealth, so to speak, that Jesus has given us. After he thoroughly explains that, now we're in a position to take what we've learned and apply it to daily life. So Paul obviously would not be a very effective preacher in 21st century America because in 21st century America, evangelical Christianity, everybody's always looking for the relevance and the application. And how does this mean to me? What does this mean to me specifically? And unless you give people one, two, three action steps you're not really considered a very effective preacher. In fact, when you take homiletics, preaching at the seminary level, if you don't give points of application, then they lower your grade. And I find that very interesting because Paul never gives any points of application for three whole chapters. Because it would be like driving a car without any gasoline in the gas tank. I mean, it is completely debilitating to a Christian to tell them what they're supposed to be doing before you tell them the resources that they have for doing what they're supposed to be doing. You see that? And so I think Paul and his mindset flips, quite frankly, a lot of the educational philosophies that we have in modern day Christianity. And in point of fact, you'll find Paul doing this all of the time. You might want to just hold your finger there in Ephesians and go back a couple of books to the left to 1 Corinthians and you look at chapter 15 
And this is Paul's, everybody knows it, it's Paul's resurrection chapter. Famous chapter in Paul. And what does he do in this whole chapter? It's not a short chapter, by the way. It goes on, what, 58 verses. 57 of the 58 verses are all about knowledge. I mean, he spends 57 verses talking about knowledge, and he doesn't get to the application until verse 58. You see that? And we know he's getting to the application because he uses the word what? Therefore, when Paul uses the word therefore, we say, what is the word therefore what? Therefore, and it typically is to flip us from doctrine to practice. So finally, we'll get to the application, and it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So we don't get an application until we get 57 verses of knowledge. And even the application is only one verse. Um, This is not just germane to the book of Ephesians, but, well, before I leave the book of Ephesians, momentarily, there's the structure. Ephesians 1 through 3, doctrine. Ephesians 4 through 6, practice. And what flips us from doctrine to practice, if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, what's the first word you see there? Therefore, so now he's going to build on the foundation of knowledge that he's just delivered. And now he gets into application. This is how the book of Galatians is set up. Chapters 1 through 4, doctrine. Chapters 5 through 6, practice. And what's the hinge word there in the book of Galatians? that flips us from one to the other. Actually, if you just go back one book to the left there, you'll see it. Galatians uh, chapter five, verse one. It was for freedom in Christ that sets us free. What's the next word? Therefore, so now we're getting into application. He's leaving doctrine and moving us into application. So Galatians is set up just like the book of Ephesians. The book of Romans is set up this way. Romans 1 through 11 is all about doctrine. Chapters 1 through 3 is humanity's guilt before a holy God. Jews, Gentiles, the whole world. Chapter 3, verse 2. 21 through chapter 5 verse 21 is all about justification. Chapters 6 through 8 is all about sanctification. Chapters 9 through 11 is all about how God's promises can be trusted because he hasn't forgotten the nation of Israel his covenanted people. God has a purpose in restoring Israel. And so you read through Romans 1 through 11, and it's all doctrine, 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 doctrine. Finally, you get to Romans 12, verse 1. And what's our favorite word, famous word there at the beginning? Therefore, now we're getting into application. Therefore, I urge you, what? Brethren, you see, he's, these are commands to the Christian. You don't give these commands to an unsaved person. They don't have the power within them via the Holy Spirit to execute the commands. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. What mercies of God? Well, everything we just got finished reading in Romans 1 through 11. And now we start seeing application. Present your body as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. I mean, he wasn't really talking about service in chapters 1 through 11. Now all of a sudden he's talking about service. So you'll notice what Paul again is doing. He is building the Christian on a foundation of truth. 
And only once that foundation of truth is recognized and absorbed and properly understood, once the Christian understands the resources that they have in Christ, now they're in a position to begin to live the Christian life and Paul will move from knowledge to wisdom. Knowledge, gnosis, wisdom, sophia, which is knowledge applied. So Paul would never go into a congregation and do a topical study on Ephesians 4 through 6 because that would, it, that would uh, be very debilitating and discouraging to tell people to do 38 things when they don't even understand the power that they have inside of them to execute or to perform those 38 things. So one of the statements that's always stuck with me, and I like to use it quite frequently, is people say the Christian life is hard. And I usually like to correct that. The Christian life is not hard. The Christian life is impossible. If you are trying to do it under your own strength. And if you just move directly into application, then without discussing knowledge, then you're giving people the impression that they ought to be doing this for Jesus, they ought to be doing this for Jesus, they ought to be doing that for Jesus, and they don't even know who they are in Jesus yet. See that? Because it's only in Christ, a famous Pauline statement, that we understand that we have the resources necessary for daily life. So I sort of um, am of the opinion that Paul wouldn't fit in with a lot of modern day evangelicalism. He certainly wouldn't fit in with a lot of day preaching philosophies. And I don't think he would fit in with a lot of what we call Christian education today. Because <laughs> to stand in the pulpit and develop meaning requires mental discipline, not only on the part of the preacher, but on the part of the listener. And your average person's attention span today really doesn't want to put themselves through that process. I mean, what they want to do is they want to come to church and they want to hear how God is speaking directly to them in their particular problem, and they want to know how to handle their immediate problem. They don't really have a lot of patience for people that want to stand in the pulpit and develop meaning first, and then move to application later. So... The things that Paul says I don't think would fit in with modern day Christianity and I don't think your average Christian that comes to church week after week really would have a lot of patience for Paul's style of teaching. And yet, if you don't understand Paul's style of teaching and you don't understand exactly what he's trying to get across, you're just going to go out there and you're just going to burn out. And you're going to think, well, Christianity works for everybody else, doesn't work for me because you're just going to see a long list of failures in your life. Because we haven't really rooted and grounded people in the reality that God never intended them to drive the, the car with the gas tank empty. I mean, God's whole point is to fill up the gas tank so people understand their resources. And once they get that, now we'll move into application. So that's sort of the danger in just jumping right in here into Ephesians 6. And that's a whole sermon in and of itself. So I'm finished the sermon on that. So let's, having said all that, let's talk about these, these pieces of armor. And given the structure of Ephesians, I think it's really important to understand that everything in, on this list has already been developed by Paul, where? Earlier in the book. So the way to understand these pieces of armor is to track down how the same terms and words are used earlier in the book. So we have six pieces of armor, and the first thing that we have mentioned is the belt of truth. And even before we get to that, let me just go ahead, if I could, and read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20 to you, if I could. Finally, now do you catch that? He doesn't begin the book with this stuff. He ends the book with this stuff because he's building on a foundation that he's already established earlier in the book. Finally, be strong 
in your own self-will, no. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, where would I learn about the strength of his might for my life? Ephesians 1 through 3 told me all about that. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to withstand firm against the schemes of the devil. Satan has schemes that are directed at your life and my life as I speak. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the what? What kind of armor are we talking about? Full armor. And the reason that's significant is for many years in my life, I was proficient maybe in one or two of these. And I thought I was doing pretty well because I developed some skill, maybe in a couple of them, but I was still defeated in many other areas because I wasn't paying attention to what the Bible says. It says, put on the full armor. In the ancient world, if you go out into battle and you're only proficient in one or two pieces or you only have one or two pieces on, then we know what's going to happen. You're going to go down in defeat. So the language here, full armor, is very significant. Therefore, take up the full armor so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. Evil day meaning the day of attack, I think. And having done everything to stand firm... Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you may be, be, may be able to extinguish. What's the next word? All. You say, what does all mean? All means all. In other words, what God has given us in the armor is 100% sufficient to be everything that you're called to be in Christ Jesus. You don't have to say, well, you know, the Bible's kind of like a piece of Swiss cheese. It's got holes in it. So I've got to go out into secular thought and plug the hole with something else. So to, to counsel effectively, I've got to go get Young and Rogers and Freud. To understand how to manage a church, I've got to get into the latest secular management theory. Um, to understand origins, I've got to dip into Darwin. The Bible makes a claim of sufficiency. Sufficient for what? Sufficient for all matters of faith and practice, which would include your armor. Everything in your armor is enough in God to extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one, an enemy far more powerful than we are. And yet God has given us the resources to extinguish all of his fiery darts. Verse 17, and to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition at all times in the spirit and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for the saints and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may proclaim it as boldly as I ought to speak. So we have these six pieces of armor, the belt of truth, verse 14, breastplate of righteousness, verse 14, sandals of peace, verse 15, shield of faith, verse 16, helmet of salvation, verse 17, sword of the spirit, verse 17. So let's see if we can march through these and see if we can understand what they mean. As we mentally appropriate these moment by moment by faith as we walk out the Christian life. The first thing we see here is the belt of truth. You'll see that in verse 14. Stand firm having girded your loins with the truth. 
um, there's a likely picture of what that represented in the ancient world. But truth is the Greek word aletheia. So to figure out what the belt of truth is, how do you think we should go about this? Should I run off to every other part of the Bible that defines what truth is? No, I should simply track how Paul has used the word truth or aletheia where? Earlier in this letter. And in fact, you'll find Paul using it twice of the gospel itself. Ephesians 1 verse 13, Ephesians 4 verse 21. You'll find him using it of doctrinal orthodoxy and stability. Ephesians 4 verse 15. And then you'll find him using it of moral purity. Ephesians 4, verses 24 and 25, and Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9. So I'm paying attention to how the word truth is used in the same book, given the structure of Ephesians. So with that in mind, I'm prepared to offer the following definition of the belt of truth. The belt of truth is the foundation of our defense, and it's standing firm in God's word as well as walking in personal integrity. So when you put on the belt of truth, you're always looking at the Bible and you're standing firm in it and you're acknowledging that it's true. The fiery dart of the wicked one comes contradicting the Bible and you say, no, I'm gonna follow and believe the Bible. And then there's not just an objective quality of it, believing the Bible, but there is a subjective quality where you are allowing your practice to catch up with your position. In other words, we're already told all about truth in Ephesians 1 through 3. Now what's happening is I'm putting on this piece of armor is I'm letting my practice catch up with my position. And I'm actually walking in personal truth or personal integrity. So we objectively stand on the truth of God's word. I can't tell you how much we need to do that today because Satan is doing everything within his power to get our eyes off God's instruction manual. In fact, John chapter 8 verse 44 gives a tremendous description of what Satan is constantly doing. And when you understand what Satan is constantly doing, suddenly this belt of truth, you see the need for it. John 8, 44, Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. Now watch this. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. In other words, He's been a liar from the beginning, since his own fall. He's going to be a liar till the very end. And even as we've studied in the book of Revelation, a thousand years of solitary confinement is not going to fix his problem. When he lies, it says here, he speaks his native language. Or he speaks from his own nature. How do you know Satan is lying? Well, his lips are moving, that's how you know. For he is a liar, now notice the definite article, he is a liar and the father of lies. Your father is your source. So he is the source of all lies and deception in the world. And so all of the time as you walk out the Christian life, is you're, you're, you're dealing with one lie after another. Even from the own, your own culture, sometimes from your own church, sometimes even in the religious world. And what you've developed is you've developed such, such a knowledge of the Bible that you can screen the two. So, well, that doesn't sound exactly right because God's word says something else. Now, unless you know something about the Bible, you have no ability to do this. You're just victimized by one deception after another. So I think this is what it means when it talks about put on the belt of truth. The Bereans... Acts 17, verse 11, who took all of the teachings of the Apostle Paul, they weren't unteachable, 
because it says they received his teachings with gladness or eagerness. Search the scriptures, how frequently? Daily, to see if the things taught by Paul were so. And the Bereans were considered more noble than the Thessalonians who didn't follow that same practice. See that? So the Bereans had put on the belt of truth. That's basically what it means to put on the belt of truth. So there is an objective quality to it, but there's also a subjective quality to it where I'm not just knowing things about the Bible, but I'm actually seeking to walk in the truth of the Bible. Now you say to yourself, well, I don't really know much about the Bible. Well, you know something about it. Everybody in here knows at least one or two things, right? Are you being faithful in your daily life to that one thing you know? And if you start becoming faithful in your daily life to that one thing you know, you watch what God does with your mind. He starts to open it up and you start to understand a little bit more about the Bible and a little bit more about the Bible. See, the problem with most people is it's not a lack of intellectual capacity. It's a volition problem or it's a will problem where we are confronted in something in our daily life from the Bible. And the fact of the matter is there's a crisis of will where we kind of like our sin. I want to hold on to this sin. And so God says, okay, then I'm not going to show you anything else until you're faithful with that one thing. Because doesn't the Bible say if you're faithful in the little things, God will trust you in the big things? See, we don't think that the little things matter. How we act around the house, uh, how we are kind of, you know, short-fused or how we're kind of unforgiving or so if I watch this particular show on TV what's the big deal yeah it's a little racy but no one's in here but me you know kind of thing and we we really don't think the little things matter but in God the little things matter because the Bible says if you're faithful with something little God trusts you with something more And so that's what putting on the belt of truth is. You hear truth, and then you see there's an inconsistency in your own life. And a lot of us are so worried about what other people are doing. Well, how come they're not putting on the belt of truth? And God says, I'm not talking about them right now. I'm talking about you. You put it on. This is a problem in your life. You don't have any control over what everybody else is doing. So the Holy Spirit places his finger on something in our life that isn't right, And we say, you know what, I'm going to try to yield to God today under his power. I'm not going to do it on my own strength. I'm going to yield to God under his own power. Guess what? You just put on the belt of truth. And then once you put on the belt of truth, God says, all right, now I can trust you with something greater. And something greater and something greater. You run into a lot of people in evangelical Christianity that are extremely talented And they're not being used by God to do anything. And you ask yourself, well, that person over there, gosh, they're very talented at X, Y, and Z. Why aren't they being more strategically used by God? And I think, and I'm not omniscient, but I think if you were to look into their lives, you would see these areas of disobedience that they haven't handed over to the Lord. If you're faithful with something small, God will trust you with something great. You've got an awful lot of talented people out there that frankly haven't been faithful with something very minor. They've never really put on the belt of truth the way God asks us, pardon me, commands us to put on the belt of truth. So that's my best understanding of the belt of truth. If you go back to Ephesians 4 verse 25 just for a moment. Here it's talking about this subjective quality. Here it's not just dealing with objective facts, but now it's subjective, it's obedience. And it says, therefore, laying aside all falsehood, speak truth to each other. Speak the truth, rather, um, each one of you 
with his neighbors, for we are all members of one another. So there it's dealing with truth. You'll see the word truth there, uh, the Greek word aletheia. And now it's not just being used as an academic, intellectual understanding of content. Now it's actually walking it out. So we have an objective dimension of it. That's what the Brians were doing. They were good students. And they were screening the teachings of Paul through what they knew, the scriptures. But then it gets beyond that and it gets into a subjective quality where you're actually walking now in personal integrity. You see, your reputation is who others think you are. That's your reputation. Reputation is not the same thing as integrity. Integrity is how you really are when no one else sees. You see that? And putting on the belt of truth involves not just staying away from certain sins because I don't want to blow my cover kind of thing, but you're actually walking out truth in personal daily life, financially, things we look at on the internet, gossip, on and on it goes. So we need to put on the belt of truth. Second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. You'll also see that in the second part of verse 14. Chapter 6, verse 14. Standing firm, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So obviously, the breastplate is not something you want to go out to war without, or you're going to take a flaming arrow right into your chest. So what does this breastplate of righteousness mean? Well, it's the Greek word for righteousness, and um, let me try to pronounce this Greek word here. I think it's pronounced uh, dikaiosuni, I think is how you pronounce that. And it's used only two other times in the book of Ephesians. That's the word righteousness. Righteousness, the word there in Greek. It's used only two other times in the book of Ephesians. And both times it is used not of positional righteousness, but practical righteousness. Positional righteousness is the idea that I'm righteous before God because of who I am in Christ. Practical righteousness involves volition or a step of the will where I'm going to now seek to live out my position in Christ. I'm going to allow my practice to catch up with my position. Gee, the Bible says that I'm righteous. Maybe I ought to act like it. And the moment you make that decision is the moment you just put on the breastplate of righteousness. So I think it's largely talking about practical righteousness. So, I, so I'm going to define the breastplate of righteousness as follows. It's our underlying protection, including our righteous character and deeds. Notice the emphasis on deeds stemming from our positional righteousness. Well, goodness gracious, where would I learn about my positional righteousness? Ephesians 1 through 3. Positional righteousness. Holy in Jesus Christ. Then you get to Ephesians 4 verse 1. Therefore. And now I begin to apply what I've learned in Ephesians 1 through 3. If Ephesians 1 through 3 says I'm positionally righteous. Then maybe my personal life and conduct should start looking like it. See that? So if you start becoming righteous. Not under your own power. Under God's power. In daily life and you start making practical decisions in that way, then you just put on, moment by moment, the breastplate of righteousness. And if you don't put this on and live consistently with our position, not sinning, not being sinless, but sinning less, if you won't do that, it's like going out to battle without a breastplate on. Your chest is wide open. And consequently, you can take an arrow right into the chest if you don't have this on. 
You say, well, do you have any examples of this? Oh my goodness, where do, where do we start? Uh, how about David? You know, David, when he, first of all, Second Samuel 11, he should have been out in combat doing what he was supposed to do. He wasn't where he was supposed to do. He was kind of hanging around the palace there and he sees a young woman bathing named Bathsheba. And it's sort of interesting that when you go to the city of David in Israel, uh, you can see exactly what that's talking about because the city of David is way up yonder on a hill and you can see everything down the hill. So you get the picture that David, you know, was sort of looking, saw something he shouldn't have seen, saw a young woman bathing. He went into lust at that point. He had the power to fulfill his lusts. So he commanded that she be brought to him, one night stand, everything's fine, right? She went home and the whole thing was forgotten. No, it doesn't work that way. She comes back and says she's pregnant and you know the rest of the story. How David actually ended up committing first degree murder of her husband to cover up his problem. And then he is confronted by Nathan the prophet, 2 Samuel 12, which would be humiliating enough. And then he's told the child that was born through this unholy union is going to die. And there's, the sword is never going to depart from your household. And David was actually deposed as king and a refuge for a long time until he was finally returned to his throne later. And it was just one headache after another in David's life, one problem after another in David's life. Why is that? Because Satan lobbed a fiery dart right into David's chest. He didn't have his breastplate of righteousness on. And he took it right into the chest and it wrecked his, to, not, I wouldn't say wrecked, but it, it brought inalterable consequences to the rest of his uh, natu- you know, earthly life. And I can't tell you how many people I know, I know so many of them, that are gifted in ministry, talented in ministry, were doing great things for God, and yet they did something where they didn't have their breastplate of righteousness on. And it has completely wrecked their ministries for decades even right up to the present day. And you say, well, doesn't God forgive? Yes, he does, he he does forgive. And I've seen God forgive and restore multiple people. But as God is my witness, their ministry, as far as I can tell, never really fully recovers. There's always this sort of dark cloud, you know, that sort of hangs over it. And it has to do with making a decision one day where you just don't have your breastplate of righteousness on. You don't, you don't allow your practice to be consistent with your position and boom, you just took it right into the chest. And Satan set you up for this. And so there we have it, breastplate of righteousness. And then we have a third piece of armor here called the sandals of peace. Notice, uh, if you will, Ephesians chapter 6, and notice verse 15. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So it mentions feet, and it mentions peace, and so we call these the sandals of peace. And it is interesting that when you study warfare, Battles are won or lost based on the quality of the footwear. And I think that's sort of a truism in in the Greco-Roman world. So we kind of look at these sandals as if they're really not important, but when you actually study armor and warfare from the Greco-Roman times, you start to see that footwear is a big deal. Your, Your battle is won or lost depending on your footwear. I mean, think if one NBA team comes out with the proper shoes on and another team comes out with, you know, bare feet or um, sandals on. I mean, you know who's going to win the game, right? In fact, we played a team uh, 
it was probably the most undisciplined team I'd ever seen in my life. And you would expect it. It was UC Santa Cruz, kind of a hippie haven. And, I mean, these people, they came out in bathing suits and, you know, the bottom and top didn't match. And you just kind of wore what you wanted to wear, you know. And it was, we just annihilated them. I don't know if we had more talent than them, but they just weren't equipped for the battle. They just had no discipline. And consequently, this is how it worked in the Greco-Roman world. Footwear becomes a big deal. So how do we ascertain or how do we determine what the sandals of peace are? Well, we simply track the word peace, which is the word irene, from which you get the word irenic. What is some, if you call someone irenic, what are you calling them? You're calling them a peaceful person. It's the opposite of polemical, you're warlike. Polemos is a Greek word meaning war. If someone is polemical, they're warlike. If someone is irenical, then they're peace, peaceful, a peaceful person. And by the way, a lot of uh, parents will name their children or their young girls Irene, which is a beautiful name. Basically, it means peaceful. All comes from this word, Irene. Irene is used seven times in the book of Ephesians, and twice it means positional peace. In other words, the war between us and God has been called off because of our right relationship with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we have peace with God. Ephesians 1 verse 2, it's also referenced in Ephesians 6 verse 23. But here's something that's very interesting. Peace is not just speaking of our vertical relationship to God. Because Ephesians 1 through 3 describes not just our individual wealth, but our what? Corporate wealth. So individually, I have a right relationship with God, but God has done something else in the body of Christ. He has taken groups that formerly hated each other's guts and united them into one new man. So you have to understand the vertical element and you have to understand the horizontal element to properly put on the sandals of peace. The vertical element we've gotten a lot of teaching on, most people understand that, but what about this horizontal element? Look back at Ephesians 2, because Ephesians 2 comes before Ephesians 6. Do you all agree with me on that? Paul, in other, and I, I bring things like this up because I'm, I'm showing you that Paul is building metaphors based on concepts he's already dealt with earlier in the book. You get into Ephesians 2 verses 14 and 15 and he's not talking about our individual peace with God. He's talking about the fact that we are together, harmonized in Christ in one new man. And the hatreds that we once had with each other on racial grounds or whatever are called off. Uh, Ephesians 2 verse 14. For he himself is our what? Peace. Who made both groups into one. Now what both groups is he speaking of here? The Jews and the Gentiles. That hated each other's guts. Because the, Gen the Jews called the Gentiles dogs and the Gentiles called the Jews arrogant. They hated each other. Now what do you do when you get a Jewish convert in the church age in Jesus Christ and the Gentile convert in the, in the church age in Jesus Christ? What happens to the former hostility between the two groups? It's canceled. Because now they are fellow brothers or fellow sisters or fellow brother and sister in the same family. Ephesians 2 verse uh, 14. 
For he himself is our peace who has made both groups into one and broken down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, hatred, which is the law of the commandment contained in the ordinances, so that he himself might make the two into what? One new man, that's the church, thus establishing what? Peace, irony. We're no longer dealing with vertical, now it's become horizontal. Uh, You drop down to verse uh, 15, I think I just read verse 15, drop down to verse 17, it says he, he came and he preached what? Peace to you, now this would be the Gentiles, who were where? Far away. I mean, we were outside. All of the blessings were coming to Israel. What about us? What about us Gentiles? Look, look at what the Lord has done here in the church. He's gotten rid of that division. Verse 17, he came and preached peace to you who are far off. And peace, there's our word mentioned twice, to those who were near. Now who were those near? The Jews. So now within this new man called the church, which began on the day of Pentecost, what do you have? You have Jew and Gentile in one new man. The hostility is canceled. The warfare is called off. You know, it's so interesting. Our society is talking all about this racial, racial issues. Do you realize that we have probably the greatest book that's ever been written on the subject of race reconciliation? You look at what happened in Acts 8, that is, that is mind-numbing, Acts 8. Because you have a hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans for 700 years. The Jews hated the Samaritans and the Samaritans hated the Jews. Who, who were the Samaritans? They were a group of people that one of the Assyrian kings brought into the land of Israel to replace the Jews that had been evicted. And they began to intermarry with others and they created kind of a half-breed race. This goes back to the book of Isaiah. I mean, this is like 700 years before Christ even showed up. And the Jews would worship in Jerusalem. The Samaritans say, we're not going to Jerusalem. We're going to Gerizim, the mountain of blessing. And so you've got religious hatred. You've got racial hatred for 700 years between the Jews and the Samaritans. It's so bad that when Jesus is speaking to a Samaritan woman, John 4, the disciples say, what in the world are you doing? First of all, you don't talk to a woman. And secondly, you don't talk to a despised race. And when Jesus, Luke 10, went into a Samaritan village and they would not respond to Christ's message, James and John, the sons of thunder, said what to Jesus? Nukem, is what he basically said. That's a loose translation. Shall we, call, shall we not call down fire from heaven to destroy these people? Why would they say something like that? By the way, that's the love apostle speaking, John. Why would he say something like that? It has to do with the 700 years of hatred. Then you get into Acts 8, and now you discover that the Holy Spirit just fell upon the Samaritans because they received Christ. And they couldn't believe it happened. The conversion happened, I should say, and actually they delayed, God delayed the giving of the Holy Spirit until the Jerusalem saints could come down and lay hands on the Samaritans. And it's what you call a transitional problem in the book of Acts. Normally the Holy Spirit comes upon people immediately when they believe in Jesus. It didn't happen this way. And everybody's trying to figure out why did God delay the giving of the Holy Spirit until the Jerusalem saints could lay hands on the Samaritans. And it has to do with 700 years of racism. Jerusalem needed to understand that in the age of the church they now belong to Samaria. And Samaria, now in the age of the church, needed to understand that they belonged to Jerusalem. And if that had not happened, you would have had an immediate rift in the body of Christ. 
and this one man that Paul is talking about wouldn't have been understood as one man. So these are all things that you gain simply by paying attention to this word irene and how it is used. So therefore, what are these sandals of peace? Because we are at peace with God, we should pursue peace and unity where? Within the church. Well, why would I want to pursue peace and unity within the church? Because that's what God has made the church into. He has brought peace to formerly conflicting groups. So the moment, because of personal reasons, I cause a division in the church, I'm not talking about truth reasons or doctrinal reasons. Most church splits and fights do not happen because of some great doctrine. They happen because people take their preferences and in their mind elevate them to scriptural truth. So churches will split over the silliest of reasons, the color of the carpet, the order of the service, whatever. When in reality, and people think they're standing for truth, they're not standing for truth at all. What they've done is they've taken a preference and they've turned it into truth under a deception and they've caused a rift in the body of Christ and they're not putting on the sandals of peace. So when we seek peace within the body, I'm putting on the sandals of peace. And there's an awful lot of scripture, folks, about God wanting peace within the family. Uh, For example, Psalm 133 and verse 1 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for the brothers to dwell in unity. I mean, assuming it's not some great doctrinal issue, we ought to be people that are trying to put away the sword, put away the backbiting, put away the division. Well, I don't like that person. They, they, don't, they don't vote the way I vote. What does that have to do with anything? I don't like that person because they're a different color or a different creed or a different this or a different that. that what does that have to do with anything? They're part of this new man that God has already decreed peace on There's not just uh, vertical peace, but horizontal peace. And when I live that out and act that out, I'm functioning in the body of Christ according to the position that God has already decreed for his body. If I won't do it, I'm not putting on the sandals of peace. You see that? So what are some things that I can do to pursue peace within the body, we'll look at Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Therefore, you know what that means. I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk, now he's dealing with practice, in a manner worthy of your calling. In other words, act like what you've been decreed to be as revealed earlier in the letter. with which you have been called, with all humility, gentleness, patience, patience. Is that in your Bible? It's in my Bible. Patience. Maybe I ought to be a little bit more patient with people. Yeah, but they're not growing the way they should be growing. Well, probably you weren't either at one point. People were patient with you. Maybe we should be patient with other people. Believe me, folks, I've got one finger out aimed at you. I've got three back at myself. I'm just as convicted by this as anybody else. Gentleness, showing tolerance for one another in love. Oh, my goodness, this will preach. Being, <laughs> being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. Why would I do that? I want my way in the church. You don't want to do that because you're living outside of your design. 
and I start making decisions along those lines, and my goodness, you know what I'm doing? I am walking out the sandals of peace, giving people the benefit of the doubt. So the application is when we pursue unity in the church, we're putting on sandals of peace. And you've got some negative examples of this in the Bible of people that weren't doing this. Two of them are Euodia and Syntyche. I call them odious and sin touchy. Who were just fighting with each other like cats and dogs. And so what does Paul say to, their, to them in Philippians 4, 2, and 3? I urge Euodia and Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. In other words, act like the position that you are. Indeed, true companion, I ask you to help these women who have shared in my struggle for the cause of the gospel together with Clement and also the rest of my fellow workers whose names, look at this, are in the book of life. Pastor, are you telling me that people can fight like cats and dogs over trivial issues in the body of Christ and still be blood-bought saints? That's exactly what I'm telling you. It doesn't matter what I'm telling you. It's what Paul's telling you. So here you have two individuals that aren't putting on the sandals of peace. And they're causing a rift in the Philippian church. I uh, don't have time to look at all these verses, but this is a major problem in, Cor- in the book of Corinthians. Paul is very worried about divisions. 1 Corinthians 1, 11, 3, 22, 11, 18, and 19, 12, 25, 15, verse 12. Don't worry if you didn't get all those down. We'll go over them next time. But the Corinthians are a negative example. They just weren't functioning according to the peace that God had decreed to them upon them at the horizontal level. So, belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, sandals of peace. Next week we'll take a look at the shield of faith and we'll look at what it means to be an unbelieving believer. Did you guys know you can be an unbelieving believer? You say, well, what does that mean? We'll come back next week and we'll unpack that. Father, we're grateful for uh, your word, your truth. Help us to put these pieces of armor on and become the people that you've called us to be. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said.